Okay, so high mass stars is the subject of today's vodcast. We're going to look at how they differ from the low mass stars that we've previously described. By high mass stars, we mean stellar classes B and O, the very top end of the stellar classes. Do recall from some of the data we looked at earlier that these stars are vanishingly rare. Combined, they form a fraction of 1% of the overall number of stars, certainly in the neighborhood of our sun, of ourselves. Um, these two classes do end in somewhat different ways. And we shall split them into two categories, really. One category we could call the intermediate size is about four to eight solar masses. And the very largest stars, we'd say, are greater than eight solar masses. And they do have somewhat different uh, final fates. In low mass stars, the proton-proton cycle is the main way of main sequence conversion from hydrogen to helium. High mass stars use a slightly different cycle, the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle, which uses carbon-12 as a catalyst. The carbon-12 itself is formed during the triple alpha process, where two alpha particles, two helium nuclei, conform to um, form a uh, isotope of beryllium, uh, and then this beryllium is hit by another helium nuclei, which creates the carbon-12. This process, the CNO cycle, does occur in our own sun, it makes about 1-2% of the uh, hydrogen burning that takes place, but in larger and hotter stars it is much more predominant, it is much more efficient, it generates much more uh, helium much more quickly, and it's, it's, it is um, a catalyzed reaction. Consequence of this, and the, the vastly increased luminosity of high mass stars, is that the time they spend on the main sequence can be as short as about 10 million years. 10 million is as compared, you remember, to 10 billion years for a solar mass star and a trillion years or more for a low mass red dwarf. So after that million years or 10 million years is up, then helium starts building up in the core, hydrogen starts burning in a shell instead of in the core, uh, energy is conducted more efficiently to the envelope of the star, and what was previously a pretty big star becomes really, really, really big. It goes into a red supergiant, and a red supergiant is one of the largest stars that you could possibly get. A little bit like its low mass equivalents, as soon as helium starts burning in the helium flash, it becomes a little bit more stable for about another million years. It shrinks, the surface layers get a bit hotter, and it forms a blue supergiant, more luminous, but less surface area, a lot hotter. Uh, while it's in the blue supergiant phase, here's a, an interesting picture that I found that compares the size of our sun, which is a small yellow star down there at the bottom right, to a portion of the blue supergiant. As the helium converts into carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, then a core of CN and O builds up, and again it goes from being a blue supergiant to being an even more luminous and even larger red supergiant star, and these stars really are the biggest stars that we have direct observations of in our galaxy. Uh, for example, um, the star VV uh, Kefi Alpha has a, a radius of I think it's approximately 1,000 astronomical units. That puts it well beyond the orbit of Saturn if you placed it into our own solar system. This final stage, by the way, is very inefficient. Large amounts of energy is lost through things like neutrinos, and it only lasts about 1,000 years. The stellar winds involved and the thermal pulses is a variable star, and these stars are most certainly variable finally shed the envelope into a planetary nebula and you have a white dwarf exposed. This is similar to the process in low mass stars except that the white dwarf instead of being composed of carbon and oxygen is composed of oxygen, neon and magnesium. And that's kind of the end of the line for an up to eight solar mass high mass star. If however you are beyond eight solar masses then you can go beyond in terms of what you can burn. Neon burns at a temperature of about 1.5 billion Kelvin and makes oxygen and magnesium. 
This is a process that only takes a few years. Spot the theme here. It takes shorter and shorter. Oxygen burns at a core temperature of 2.1 billion Kelvin, making silicon, sulfur, phosphorus. Builds a heavy silicon core. That silicon core melts into a sea of helium, protons, and neutrons in a process that takes as little as one year before we start silicon burning. This is known as the silicon burning day because it only lasts for approximately one day. You have a core temperature of 3.5 billion Kelvin, a density of 1 times 10 to the 11 kilograms per meter cube, and it builds a heavy nikon ion core. While it's doing this, it has an extremely strong stellar, um, uh, stellar wind. Uh, one example of a star that we currently know of in this existence is uh, the star Eta Carinae. Uh, here is a picture of, well, I'd say it's a picture of Eta Carinae, but it's actually kind of hard to see behind the huge amount of nebulosity that's built up. In a relatively short amount of time, uh, we're not sure exactly what star stage Eta Carinae is in. It could still be in the sort of carbon burning stage, in which case it might have a few thousand years to go, or it might have much, much less time to go. So at the time, at the end of the silicon burning day, we've built up an inert iron core, and above that, an, in, an onion skin of nested shells. So uh, magnesium, silicon, magnesium, neon, oxygen, carbon, helium, hydrogen, fusion. Above that, we still have a very large envelope of non-burning hydrogen that still remains. Over the course of one day, the iron core builds a mass to about 1.2 to 2 solar masses. That core is as far as we can go. Iron is the end of the line for nuclear fusion. You can't create any more energy by fusing iron. Instead, it takes up energy. So when that iron core begins to contract and heat up, there's nothing there to generate radiation pressure needed to oppose the gravitational motion. The collapse is final and the collapse is catastrophic. And what happens next, we'll look at in the next podcast.